Good morning. How are we today? Good. Good to see everybody. How many people love a new gadget? Don't you like new tech gadgets when they work? When they work. Uh, a couple of years ago, we, we moved into a home that had a very, very old uh, garage door. And my son and I were playing hockey on the front of our driveway. It had a glass window. And my son took a great shot. It was a really great shot and went to the top window and shattered it. And so that was a great excuse to replace our garage door. So we did that and we had to spend, you know, more money than we wanted to on a garage door. But the great thing was it came with this gadget that it was uh, attached to my phone. So whenever the garage door would open, I would get a notification on my phone. When it would close, I'd get the same notification. If my kids were locked out, I could use that app and actually open up my driveway anywhere in the world I was. It's a pretty cool gadget, right? It's, uh, it provided some security because as I'm getting a little bit older, sometimes I forget, did I close the garage or not? And I can just check my phone and say, yes, it is closed. Or my kids forget their key and they get locked out. I can just, they can call me or text me and I can open up the garage whenever I want. It's an incredible gadget, incredible device. My wife does not have this app on her phone, even though we have the same garage door and we have the same app available because she doesn't have this phone on this, this app on her phone, she can't access these resources, which is too bad for her. <laughs> too many gadgets, too many technological things can go wrong. And in my eyes, that's a really a picture of what it looks like for us when we don't access the resources that God has entrusted to us. A lot of us have all these apps, all these resources available to us at our fingertips. And yet because we don't access them or maybe we don't understand them, then we don't have the security like I have when my garage door is closed, that you don't have the security as a believer. Maybe you're wondering, do I really have a relationship with God or not? Or this week I'm feeling down, this week, last week I felt up. And we kind of go through this schizophrenic journey where I feel high and low and high and low. And this series really is about accessing the resources of God reminding us of why Easter is so significant, not just about celebrating a great day about the resurrection, but why the cross and why the resurrection together affects everything about us. And so this series is called Brand New. And if you're gonna bring it into a summary, it is what we talked about last week. Paul said that those of us who are in Christ are a new yeah, you guys were listening. That's great. That's always encouraging for a preacher. You're a new creation. The old is gone and the new is here. Today, we're going to talk about another aspect because there's a lot of aspects of what making brand new is about. It's about different things, not just the new creation idea, but everything changed when you and I, if you have a relationship with God. And so that's the caveat because Paul says, if anyone is in Christ, not everybody is in Christ. So if you've received the gift of salvation, then you have been made brand new. And it's a journey for us to access those resources, to walk out those resources and to use those resources for the rest of our lives. Today, I wanna to do something a little different. Would you guys stand together just in the honoring of the reading of God's word? We're gonna be in Ezekiel chapter 11. I wanna read a, a Hebrew prophecy first, talking about something that would take place in the future. This was written in the six or 700 BC, 700 years approximately before Jesus returned or came back to the earth, I should say. And writing to a group of people that were in exile, the Jews who were captured and taken away from Jerusalem, away from Israel. And so Ezekiel chapter 11, 17 to 20, this is our central teaching text today a prophecy about what God's going to do one day. And he said this, therefore say, this is what the sovereign Lord says. I will gather you from the nations and I will bring you back from the countries where you have been scattered. I will give you back the land of Israel again. They will return to it and remove all its vile images and detestable idols. I will give them an undivided heart and put a new spirit in them. I will remove from them their heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh. Then they will follow my decrees and be careful to follow and keep my ways. They will be my people and I will be their God. Let's pray. Father, we stand to get today, we stand in the honoring of the reading of your word. God, we don't treat this casually 
for this is the very word of God. It's been handed down to us from generation after generation by faithful men and women, God, who have preserved these ancient words, not just as a story, but as a living testimony of who we are as the people of God. And so, Father, for those who are discouraged today, I pray that you would encourage them. God, for those who are distracted, God, I pray that you would bring clarity. God, for those who feel hopeless, I pray that you would bring hope. And God, for those who are not in Christ today, I pray that today would be the day that they welcome you as their leader and their savior. We pray this in Christ's name, amen. Thank you guys so much. You may be seated. So today it's about the new heart. We talked about new creation last week. We're talking today about the new heart. What God would do one day, he would give us an undivided heart. He would give us a new spirit. And when we think about, if I was gonna ask you or ask a bunch of people today in our city today, what's wrong with the world? You would say, well, that's a loaded question, right? What's wrong with the world? Somebody that's a Marxist might say capitalists are what's wrong with the world. Capitalists would say taxes are what's wrong with the world. People that are into the health industry would say gluten's what's wrong with the world, right? Barbie would say men are what's wrong with the world. We have all kinds of answers of what's wrong with the world. We have life hacks. And if we could just get a little bit more efficient, if we could just be a little bit better, a little bit more organized, if we could have a vision board, then our life would be better. And and so we had the question, how do we have a better life? It could be answered through politics or religion or through the economy or through health or a myriad of different answers. But God has a different answer. Man looks at the outside, but God looks at the inside. Man always tries to fix our problems with external things, by a vision board, with life hacks, with trying hard, getting up earlier, and all those things are fine and good. Or blaming people for the problems, but the problem is when you put a new person into office, guess what? They've got a corrupted heart too. And so the oppressor becomes the oppressor. And it's sort of a cycle throughout history. And so throughout the the story of the people of God, if you know the story of Israel, it's a very disappointing story because the people of God are given land, they're given promises, and finally they're rescued from Egypt out of slavery. And God does all these miraculous deeds, and they finally, after 400 years, are rescued from Egypt. (coughs) Pardon me. And then they get the land, and then they finally inherit the promised land, and they get peace and prosperity. God's with them. All these miracles take place. And yet, within one generation of Joshua's conquest of Israel, They start to worship the gods around them. Even though God warned them over and over and over again, do not follow the ways and the the, the religions of the neighbors around you or I will leave my presence from you. And unfortunately, God gave chance after chance after chance and leader after leader rose up. Some leaders were good. Most often they were not. And they followed the ways of the world. They followed the other idols. They followed the other religions. And so here, God's writing to the people that are in exile again. The same people who were rescued from Egypt are now in Babylon. And he's writing to them to try to give them hope, to try to give them a sense of what's happening. As you can imagine, as the children of Israel, God's chosen people, they were oppressed. They were taken out of their land and taken out of their security. And God says, I'm going to do something about that. I'm going to do all these things. I'm going to... I'm going to give you back your land. Then you're going to come back. You're going to remove all those idols that are being worshiped in Israel. And then he says, I will give them an undivided heart and I will put a new spirit in them. I will remove them from them, their heart of stone, and I will give them a heart of flesh. They will be my people and I will be their God. If you look at this from an English standpoint, if you just focus on the action It's the word, I will, I will, I will. As we talked about last week, everything about being brand new starts with and ends with who? God. God is the one that makes us brand new. We were old, God made us brand new. We were dead, God made us alive. I will bring you back. I will put a new spirit upon you. I will give you a brand new way to relate to me. As we think about the heart in the, in the Hebrew Bible and most of the Bible, the word heart is, was the way that they understood the brain, the will, the emotions all together. When someone said your heart, 
in the Bible, what they were talking about was not the organ inside of our chest cavity. They were talking about our will, our emotions, our morality, really everything that we define about us was our heart. And so when God says, I will give them a heart of flesh, he's saying, I'm going to completely change the kind of person that they used to be. A heart of stone. When you think about a heart of stone, what do you think about? You might think of rigid or concrete. It's unpliable. You can't use it. It's, it's, so, it's so dry and so formed that you can't even use it. it can't, it's already been molded. And that's another word for stubborn, that God described his people because of their idolatry as stubborn people, continuing to chase after other gods, continuing to chase after other things instead of the one true God. They had a divided heart. God had given them the law. God had given them the land. God had given them all these blessings, but it wasn't long until they started to chase after other things. I don't know anybody that struggles with that in this room. So God says, I'm going to replace their stubborn heart, their dead heart with a heart of flesh, which a heart of flesh, it's soft. It's moldable. As I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, I'm a hockey coach. And congratulations to me because we are back-to-back Montreal city champions, you know? It's actually not me. It's uh, the kids. It's all, it's all about the kids. But as a coach, you know, you take some joy in that. Um, but I, I said this a couple of weeks ago, the kind of the kind of player that I love to coach, sounds kind of funny, but kids that are coachable. A coachable kid is somebody who wants to get better. We had a couple of kids on our team. I'm not going to mention any names, but anytime you told them something, they always had an excuse. They always blamed it on the other player. They always said, yeah, but, and guess what? That player didn't really improve the whole year. In fact, in some ways they got worse because they resisted correction and not that we're perfect, but we're able to observe things that the player is not. And sometimes they're listening to their dad in the stands who's never played hockey before rather than the coaches who have spent years. We've got 50 years of experience between our three coaches. It's a little bit of what it's like. A stubborn heart is an uncoachable heart. A stubborn heart resists correction. A stubborn heart resists the wisdom of God. A stubborn heart says, I know what to do. I know how to be happy. I know what's going to make me uh, go high and what's going to make me go low. And God wants us to have soft hearts, hearts that are ready to receive correction, hearts that have humility and not stubbornness. It's interesting because if you think about the idols that Israel was worshiping all through Israel, there were idols on top of the high places in the Holy Land of Israel. Can you imagine? Physical symbols of different gods. And most often, you know what they are made out of? Stone. And so God, in a way, is saying that you become what you worship. If you worship stone idols, your heart will become a heart of stone. If you worship trash on Netflix, you will have a trashy heart. If you follow after lust, you will have a lustful heart. If you fantasize about greed, you will have a greedy heart. And so we become who and like we worship. And and God's giving us an encouragement here because he says that you cannot change on your own. He's talking about the new covenant, by the way. This is a brand new relationship that God would one day enact. And again, it didn't fully happen until Jesus returned to the earth. And in in some sense, we're still going to be chasing this reality until Jesus returns for the second time. But this reality, I will give them a new heart, an undivided heart. I will give them a spirit. And so they will start to worship me and follow me. That's totally an act of grace. It's totally an act of grace. So if you ask people what's wrong with the world, they might answer with politics or health or the economy or blaming a political leader or blaming oppression and all those things can be true. But what God says, those are external things that need to be fixed. But the primary problem with our world today is not external things. It's something inside of me. I love what G.K. Chesterton, the great British author said at the beginning of the 19th century, when somebody in the London Times wrote, what's wrong with the world today? And we could almost have that in the Montreal Gazette today. As wars are going on, as things are happening in the economy today, we could have the exact same question in the Montreal Gazette. What is wrong with the world today? And that very wise English author, G.K. Chesterton said, I am 
Sincerely yours, G.K. Chesterton. What he was saying in that very pithy response is that you and I are what's wrong with the world. As much as we want to blame other people, you and I are probably, we're part of a system of self-centeredness and dead-heartedness, of stubbornness, and that can't be solved with external things. The Word of God, the Apostle Paul, said that very plainly, there is no one righteous, not even one. And one of my most, maybe one of the most least popular scriptures in the Bible, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 Paul says that you were dead in your transgressions and your sins. So if you're going to ask God what's wrong with the world today, he would say, you are. And he, he could point the finger at us and we would be okay, maybe okay with that because he's God, right? If somebody else did that, we would say, hey, hey, you, you're what's wrong, right? But God says, you, your heart is stubborn. Your heart is just like the children of Israel. I've given you all these blessings. And instead of worshiping me and being grateful to me, you thank yourself and you worship other things. Instead of worshiping, worshiping the creator, you worship these created things. So God is not focused on the external. He's focused on the heart. This week, I got a, an email from a friend of mine. He did a lot of the graphics for City Church in the first five or six years. He, did, he actually lives in between Ottawa and Montreal and Embram in Ontario. And he, was, uh, he, showed, he shared a video with me of his life journey because he recently had open heart surgery. He's younger than me. He's got kids that are younger than me. And it was an incredible story about how he, he felt that something was going on. And so miraculously, he got to the hospital and they opened up his chest cavity and they found that his heart had collapsed. And if he didn't go to the hospital, probably within 30 minutes, he would have died. He needed open heart surgery in his 30s to repair a valve that was broken. And a well-meaning person might say, well, you just need to eat some more vegetables right? You just need to stop eating gluten. Maybe you're not feeling well because of this or that. And those things all could be true. But what fundamentally was wrong with my friend was that he needed a brand new heart. And that's what God is illustrating to us that in ourselves, that we are dead and we have nothing to offer God. We need God to do something for us that we can't do for ourselves. Can anyone say amen to that? Jesus had a conversation with a Jewish guy named Nicodemus in John chapter three, verses five and six. Jesus said, very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and of the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. What Jesus is saying is that you and I were born in Adam. We are born as, old, as dead people, as people that are born under the curse of sin. And because we're in the ancestry of Adam and Eve, we only have that self-centered, stubborn heart. So Jesus comes along and says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, I am the door, I am the shepherd. He says all these I am statements claiming to be God. And he says that nobody can enter into the kind of relationship that I want to give people unless it's through me. And that can only happen if, if God himself gives us a new heart and a new spirit. Again, you and I, we focus on the external things, reading and meditating and life hacking our way and getting healthier and all those things can be good. Richard Foster, the great author about the spiritual life, he says this, I want you to listen to this. Thinking about us in the North American church in, the, in 2024, this is kind of how we think about things. We tend to focus, Foster says, on specific actions but God focuses on us. We work from the outside in. God works from the what? From the inside out. Don't you praise God for that? We can clean ourselves up. We can get better. We can put on a nice Sunday outfit. You guys look great today, by the way. Did I compliment you yet? We can do all those things. And I hope that we brush our teeth. And I hope that we take, you know, all these things are good. But we focus so much on the external God works from the inside out. We try, but God transforms. That's the gospel. Uh, my fear is that people that come to City Church, my greatest fear is that you will hear a message like this and you'll leave here thinking, I've got to try harder. I've just got to be better. And that's a fruit of your relationship with God. But hear me, you cannot try hard enough. Only God can transform you from being dead to being alive. Only God can take a stubborn heart and give you a stone 
a stone heart and giving you a heart of flesh. Amen. Only God can stop you from thinking only about yourself and how you look and how you feel and how you want to grow and help you to focus on others. You want a great marriage? Focus on your spouse. You want to have great kids and kids. You want to have, you want to be an honorable person, love and honor your mom and honor your dad. Think about others. And that can only happen through a transformed heart. Not long ago, I, I took my car in. It was not doing too well. It was sputtering and uh, it was going on for a couple of months. And so I got some oil changes. I even took it to the car wash. I added some oil. I thought if I got, you know, cleaned up the car, got some new tires, everything would be fine. And I took it into the clinic and they told me that I needed a brand new engine. I was like, oh, that's why it's not working. Uh, the car wash didn't work. I was like, you know, sometimes your car works better when it's clean. But don't you do that? It's a, it's a little symbol of how I, I, I handle my life. If I could just tweak something, just a little tweak here and there, a couple of tweaks, everything's going to be better. But what God says to us, if you're a follower of Jesus, he's given us a brand new heart. And he's given us access to his spirit. Without his spirit, we are dead. We have only self-centeredness and we have only a, a way of being selfish towards other people. God gives us a new heart. And with that, he gives us a new spirit. It's kind of synonymous, it goes together. And so here's what I love us to think about. You might ask the question with this message, so what? So God's given me a new heart. He's given me a new spirit. What does that mean? Because I think if you're anything like me, maybe you're frustrated. You're not where you want to be spiritually. You haven't grown as fast as you want to. You're not, the, you're not the husband you thought you'd be or the wife you thought you'd be. Maybe you're, you feel a lot of discontent. Maybe you feel hopeless. Maybe you just don't experience the power that these people in the Bible seem to have. And you just wonder what's wrong with you. And there's a lot of different answers to that, but here's what I'd like us to think about. If you are a brand new creation, I say the word if, because I don't want to assume that everybody in this room has received the gift of salvation, that you have received the gift and the payment of your death with the death of Christ who died so that you could have life. That's the gospel that at the cross, Jesus, the son of God laid down his life. He died so that you could have life, that his heart stopped so that you could have a brand new heart. That's the gospel. So if you have not received that, I want to give you an opportunity today to do that. But if you have received that, Paul says something about that. He says in Galatians chapter five, verses 16 to 17, what do we do with this new heart? What do we do with this new spirit? And Paul says this. And so I say, he would say this to us, just as he said to the Galatians, walk by the spirit, walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh for the flesh desires. What is contrary to the spirit and the spirit, what is contrary to the flesh. They are in what they are in conflict. They're at war with one another so that you are not to do whatever you want. And so if you're a follower of Jesus today, what Paul would say to me, what Paul would say to you is that you and I have a brand new orientation. We are to be led by the Holy Spirit. We are not to feed our flesh or feed our natural desires. We are to feast on the word of God. We are to be led by the thoughts and the intentions and the purposes of God. Amen. And here's some good news. Even this guy who wrote this very lofty passage struggled with this. Doesn't that make you feel better sometimes? This giant of a Christian, the apostle Paul, he said this, in fact, I, this really encourages me. The things that I don't want to do, I do it. And the things that I don't want to do, guess what? I do it. So if Paul struggled with the Christian life, you and I are going to struggle but we've got to understand. Remember I talked about the apps at the beginning of the message. We've got to understand the resources that God has entrusted to us, that you and I have that new heart. We have that new orientation. We have that new spirit. And so Paul says, activate it. Walk by the spirit. He says that over and over in the New Testament. Walk by the spirit. Walk by the spirit. Don't walk by the flesh. In other words, don't put one foot in front of the other, just like everybody else is into that path of destruction where the world is heading. Instead, walk on the narrow path, walk the path of the spirit, 
the still small voice of God when it's so noisy in the other direction. I'm not the, I'm not the only one who struggles with the noise of this world. It pulls me, it allures me. It's trying to get me to go where everyone else is going. And Paul says, I say to you, because you have a brand new identity, a brand new orientation, walk by the spirit. If you walk by the spirit, you will feed on the spirit. You will feed on the things of God. You will become more like Jesus. And yet, even as a, as a Christ follower, you can decide to feed on the flesh and then you will go backwards in your spiritual journey you'll act like everybody else. And that's why a lot of people today don't have victory in their spiritual life. It's because they might've made a decision to follow Jesus at one point in their life, but it hasn't changed anything about who they are. It hasn't changed their habits. It hasn't changed their orientation. It hasn't changed how they do their career, how they think about money, how they do relationships. And we fundamentally misunderstand why Jesus died. Jesus died to totally transform our hearts totally transform what we think about, what we get excited about, who we live for. And here's the great news. Here's the hope of this message. If we walk by the Spirit, we will want different things. We will want the things of God. We will want to be holy as God is holy. We will crave the growth that Christ will produce in us. So Paul says, walk by the Spirit. Don't gratify the desires of the flesh. Finally, what would it look like if all of us together could just grasp, even in a, in a greater way today, not totally, because that's not realistic, but what if you and I could grasp what God wants to do in us and through us in this message? If God gives us this brand new heart, this brand new spirit, he wants us to have this brand new orientation to please God and to be helpful for our city. I want to close with this passage in Hebrews chapter eight. It's a promise of Jesus through the new covenant And he says this, this is the covenant that I will will establish with the people of Israel after that time declares the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. Let's just stop there for a second. For the follower of Jesus, you are possessed by God. God is your heavenly father that holds you so tight that you are held deeply in the arms of God. Isn't that encouraging? That he is your God and you are his. Stop. It doesn't matter if you've had a bad week. It doesn't matter if you've had a bad month. It doesn't even matter if you've had a bad decade. If you have been following the ways of this world, you can come back. And because of the death and the resurrection of Christ, he has made you brand new. It's an incredible promise. I will be their God and they will be my people. Now here's, here's some hope. Listen to this in verse 11. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to another, know the Lord because, listen to this, they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest. For I will forgive their wickedness and I will remember their sins no more. Are you a follower of Jesus? God has remembered your sins no more. Do you pray for your kids? Do you worry about them? I do. What a great promise. He says, no longer will we have to teach our neighbor, say to them, know the Lord, because listen to them. They will all know me from the least of them to the greatest. What a promise for, for parents today. My kids are now in high school and they're, they're starting to have influences outside of the home. And I wish I could just control them but I can't, right? That's part of being a parent. You start to let them go. But what a promise that because of their decision to follow Jesus, because they've been around City Church, they've been blessed by you guys and they've been in our home that God promises to bring them home. Now it's not automatic. We have a, we have a work to do. It doesn't mean we just put up our feet, but there's a promise there that when, when you and I are up at night waiting for our kids to get home, God is in their hearts. God is watching their steps. God is the light of their path. Amen. From the least to the greatest, he will remember our sins no more. So let me encourage you with this. If he is our God, let's be his people. We called our name City Church. That we want to be the kind of church, we want to be the kind of people by the grace of God, that one day when we're called to be home, 
that God would say, look at this man, look at this woman, look at this church, look at these people. They love their neighbors. And there's gonna be people in heaven standing shoulder to shoulder with us because you and I gave our lives for the good of our city. Because we invited, because we prayed, because we give, because we sacrifice, there are gonna be people enjoying the benefits of the kingdom of God for all of eternity. God has given us a new heart and a new spirit. That's not about ourselves. It's not about me. It's about the good of our city. It's about the glory of God. And as we get that new heart and that new spirit, we live for others so that our kids will be made brand new. Amen. So that our neighbors could be made brand new creations in Christ. Those who were dead could be made alive in Christ. That's our prayer. That's our hope. That's the orientation of City Church. Our kids would be made brand new. Our neighbors would be made brand new. And by the grace of God, increasingly, the city of Montreal would be made brand new because of the hope of Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Father, we just are in awe of your goodness to us. Thank you for reminding us, Father, that it's your work, it's not ours. So encourage us, Father. Remind us, God, that you don't hold our shame and our condemnation against us, that you remember our sins no more. God, we were dead, we were stubborn, we were hopeless without you. So right now, I pray that you would renew us with the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, would you come? Give us the grace this week to walk by the Spirit and to move towards those who do not have this relationship with God yet. God, thank you that you've given us the grace to live in the city of Montreal for the benefit of our city. So Father, help us to be the salt and the light. And Father, we just want to close. If there's anyone here, Father, who has never made the decision to become a new creation, God, maybe they've never understood before that they were dead, that they are hopeless without you, that today, would you just give them the courage to step over the line of faith, to reach out their hand to you, because Father, you are reaching down to us through the cross. You're saying, I want to make you brand new. So Father, if there's anyone here, would they just raise up their hand right now just to acknowledge that they would like to receive the gift of salvation, the gift of eternal life. Father, thank you. Thank you for those hands. Thank you for how you're working in our lives. And I pray that this week we would live lives of gratitude. So Holy Spirit, would you come, would you minister to us as we sing these next songs in Christ's name, amen.